My walks take me to every corner of Britain as I seek out history embedded in the landscape. In this country, you're never very far from mysterious ruins or the shadow of unwelcome visitors. So from romantic moors to majestic peaks, I'm really enjoying some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me through a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time, I'm walking through the West Yorkshire Moors to discover how they inspired England's greatest literary family and two of the finest novels ever written. This classic moorland became the backdrop both for Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. Why? Because it was the real-life home of their creators, the tragic but brilliant Bronte sisters. This is the Worth Valley in West Yorkshire. Just 10 miles from Bradford and Halifax, it's known to millions of people as Bronte country. In the early 19th century, the countryside here was home to three exceptionally talented novelists. Charlotte, Emily and Anne Bronte were born into a world of mills and moors, where nearby Bradford was becoming the wool capital of the world. Today, the city's wool exchange is a bookshop, where the Victorian past lives on in print. The Brontes write about love and hardship in this really intense and passionate way that still feels raw 150 years later. Although I must admit there's a part of me that does find whole chunks of the books really hard going. I reckon I'm in the minority though because there, there are legions of Bronte fans who simply can't put them down. And after all these years, they still fly off the shelves. The most famous Bronte novels are Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. They've been translated into almost every language on earth and turned into over a hundred films, plays and dramas. But the lives of the three sisters and their wayward brother Branwell read like one of their books. So I've put together a four-day circular walk to uncover their story. From their birthplace in Thornton, I'll venture out into the countryside where they set so many of their stories, ending my first day at the family home in Haworth, a Victorian village with a killer secret. On day two, I'll step onto the moors and visit a crumbling ruin immortalised in Jane Eyre. Day three sees me explore the empty wilderness that inspired Wuthering Heights before moving down into the Calder Valley. Luddenden is the first stop on my final day before it's over the moors once more to the tragic final chapter in the Bronte saga, back at Haworth. I'm starting my walk in Thornton, which is four miles from Bradford city centre. In 1815, this was a small country village where a new curate, the Reverend Patrick Bronte, had just arrived to set up home with his wife, Mariah. They already had two young daughters, two-year-old Mariah and baby Elizabeth, and they were to have four more children over the next five years. Here we are. This is where the Bronte story started, 77 Market Street, Thornton. They don't shout about it, do they? There's no big ticket office or advertising hoardings. It's just this little plaque. In this house were born the following members of the Bronte family, Charlotte, 1816, Patrick Branwell, 1817, Emily Jane, 1818, and 1820. Number 77 has now become a coffee shop. Can I have a cappuccino, please? Yeah, of course. The current owner, Mark De Luca, is more barista than Bronte. He's created a literary cafe inside this simple terraced house. Patrick Bronte complained that it was ill-constructed and inconvenient, but it was a happy home for his growing family. 
It's a bit kind of weird that you come up these little steps so close to the front. Yeah, well, uh, this was extended in the 1900s when it was Lovitz the Butchers. So this is the authentic bit? Yeah, this is the kitchen. This is where the Brontes were born, in front of the fireplace. The real thing? The real thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been retained for all these years, so, yeah, it's a great piece. Patrick Bronte wanted to give his children the best start in life he could. He'd been born in a poor farm worker's cottage in Ireland, but he'd fought his way to Cambridge and believed that education was the key to escaping poverty. In 1820, just four months after Anne was born, Patrick started a new job in a larger parish. So like the Brontes, I'm making the journey to their new home in the village of Haworth. It wasn't a long journey for them, just seven miles along valley roads in their two flat wagons. My route is more exposed. My first taste of the moors and a path once used by pack horses. You can see why they still call this place Black Moor. The thick carpet of heather and rough grass means only hardy souls like North Country Cheviots are found up here. But whether you take the high road or the low road, you're still rewarded with a fantastic view of your destination, Haworth. Huh. That's not bad, is it? Actually, it only took me about 40 minutes to cross Blackmoor, but you can imagine the kids going, are we nearly there yet, Papa? Are we nearly there? Haworth is every bit the classic Yorkshire village. By 1820, this parish of scattered sheep farms had found a new source of wealth, the water that drains off the moors. In the 1800s, brand new machines powered by water and steam were transforming the cloth making industry in places like Haworth. When the Brontes arrived, Haworth was no longer a small village. It was an expanding township with 18 textile mills spread out across the valley employing four and a half thousand men, women and children. This population squeezed into narrow sandstone houses built into the hillside. At the top was Patrick's Parish Church, accompanied by its rather grand parsonage. Not a bad step up from a terrace in Thornton. The new Bronte home overlooked the graveyard, where I'm meeting the current vicar, Peter Mayo-Smith. When Patrick got this job, do you reckon he felt he'd landed on his feet? It's so gorgeous here. Well, it's gorgeous now. I'm not sure it would have been when he arrived. Imagine this place without trees, no buildings behind, a church that was actually falling down when he arrived, <laughs> very cold, and a working-class village, very mill-oriented, with children working in the mills and things like that. The graveyard... Well, I was going to say it looks very beautiful. It looks very packed. It is packed. Estimates between 20 to 60,000 bodies. 20 to 60,000? Yes, as many as that. such a tiny place. Yes. And now, Patrick's predecessor, one of his predecessors, William Grimshaw, it's reputed did 1,000 baptisms a year and never saw the population increase. That gives you an idea of what's going on. So that's indicative of a lot of disease that kills? Unfortunately, yes. Haworth was one of the unhealthiest places to live in Victorian England. Tuberculosis flourished and decaying matter from the graveyard seeped down into the stream which people used for drinking water. 40% of children here didn't reach their fifth birthday. The average life expectancy was just 25 years. I'd like to show you this, Tony, which yeah. I think illustrates the problem very well. If we have a look at it, we've got Elizabeth. She dies in 1857 at the time of Patrick Bronte. She's only six years old. And then we've got Mary, another daughter, who dies when she's two. Yes. Then Sarah, another daughter, 24. Yep. Emma, a daughter. 21. And Joshua, their son. 24. That gives you a good picture of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. It's really very sad. A year after they moved into the parsonage, Patrick's own wife, Mariah, died from uterine cancer, aged 38. Their two oldest daughters died next from tuberculosis, which they caught at a nearby boarding school. 
a devastated Patrick decided for the time being to bring up Charlotte, Branwell, Emily and Anne at home. It created a bond between the four children which would last their entire lives. Charlotte and Branwell were suddenly the eldest and they used their imaginations to escape the grim reality of life in Haworth. One day all the kids are around and their dad comes in with this box of soldiers for his little boy Branwell. But before Branwell had even had a chance to lay them all out, Charlotte, who was by far the bossiest, grabbed one of them and said, that is the Duke of Wellington. And then one of the other kids said that one of them was somebody else and another kid, that's somebody else, that's somebody else. And that was the start of the fantasy worlds and adventures and landscapes that the four kids created together over the next few years. Charlotte and Branwell decided that their new heroes ruled an imaginary kingdom called the Glass Town. They chronicled it in obsessive detail. I've been allowed to handle these tiny magazines, which it suggested the Bronte children published for their little soldiers to read. The stuff that I liked best, and it actually completely blew me away when I first read this. They've got tiny little adverts here, uh, which are quite bizarre. To be sold, a hundred horses by Gerald Dreadful. To be lent, the unprecedented sum of sixpence by Private Candlestick, who dwells between the gates of the Wall of Jericho and the Wall of China. Grand proposal by Sergeant Shuffle, which if carried into effect, will enable men to go to prison for nothing. It's Monty Python, it's the goon show. The booklets imitated real-life journals in their father's library, like Blackwood's magazine. But they also included poems, which are so much more than just childish parodies. Listen to this poetry. I think it's quite extraordinary. Tis pleasant on some evening fair after a summer's day, when still the breeze and calm the air, and sea waves gently play, to view the bay, or whose still breast white sails do softly glide. It's so effortless, so gentle. She, Charlotte was 12 or 13 when she wrote that. Just staggering. The children had discovered a passion for storytelling and writing, which perhaps helped fill the void left behind by the deaths of their mother and sisters. But eventually the children's imaginations would take them beyond the confines of the parsonage. You can imagine them, can't you, peering out of the windows at the wildness of the moors beyond. And that is where I'm heading tomorrow. I'm on a walk through West Yorkshire and the countryside that inspired the Brontes, England's greatest literary family. Today, I want to discover how their storytelling evolved from innocent childhood fantasies to Charlotte's passionate breakthrough novel, Jane Eyre. My route this morning takes me over Peniston Hill and on to Haworth Moor, where as children, the Brontes let their imaginations run wild. Then after lunch, I'm following the Bronte Way as far as Wycolla Ruin in Lancashire, which is said to have inspired Jane Eyre's final chapter. The Brontes were very close as children. They'd all been deeply affected by the death of their mother and two elder sisters. They found solace in writing, but it would be wrong to imagine them as unhappy. There's a wonderful description of their earliest adventures on the moor by their nursemaid, Sarah Gars. She says, their afternoon walks as they sallied forth, each neatly and comfortably clad, were a joy. Their fun knew no bounds. It never was expressed wildly, bright and often dry, but deep. It occasioned many a merry burst of laughter. They then enjoyed a game of romps, and played with zest. I can just imagine the Bronte children filing out across Peniston Hill, like a Yorkshire version of the Von Trapps. 
The children became more obsessed by the imaginary world that they'd created with each passing year. Branwell drew maps of a land they now called Angria, while Charlotte dreamt up romantic heroes like the imperious Duke of Zamorna. But the language and atmosphere were pure Yorkshire. The fictional capital of Angria was surrounded by dark moors. It was a romanticised version of grimy industrial Howarth with its cloth-working mills and these sandstone quarries. Pretty chunky, isn't it? Apparently a lot of this stuff was used to pave the streets of London, which is quite an interesting fact, well, I think so, anyway. Oh, well, we're only about a mile outside of Howarth, but already it's quite spectacular, isn't it? That's Howarth there. But then, if you swing over to the north, this is the Pennine Way going over in that direction. So, what with all the Bronte fans and the long-distance walkers, these tracks are pretty well trodden. The path from Peniston leads into a well-hidden valley, where local legend says the sisters used to stop and compose their stories. This is the Bronte chair. There's no evidence whatsoever that the Brontes ever sat on it, but obviously a few hundred thousand people have over the years. See how the erosion has made it all nice and smooth. It is pretty plausible, isn't it, that the Brontes would have sat on it. I mean, if you were a kid and you were coming this way and you saw this, you'd sit on it. But the other thing is it gives you a fantastic view of that. These are the Bronte Falls although the name's just a bit of early 20th century marketing. But we do know that Charlotte came here at least once because she wrote about them in a letter. She said that she came here in winter when they were in full raging flow and described them as white and beautiful, which probably isn't the greatest bit of Bronte descriptive writing ever, but you can imagine after a bit of rain it would be fairly accurate. The Bronte sisters had an unusual upbringing. Their father, Patrick, was unlike other Victorian parents. He treated his daughters as the intellectual equals of his son. I want to find out how this made them different from other children their age. So I'm meeting up with Anne Dinsdale. What were they actually like? Well, to people outside the family, they seemed very quiet and subdued. But in their own company, they were quite lively and quite boisterous. If you and I had seen them, would we have thought that they were a little bit weird? Probably. <laughs> they didn't have a lot of contact with um, children in the village. They spent a lot of time together in their own company. They were quite highly educated. And I think it's true to say they had quite an unusual education because um, the, the girls were allowed to sit in on Bramwell's lessons with their father. So they had knowledge of the classics and Latin. And also Patrick didn't censor their reading. So they were allowed to read the works of Lord Byron, which were considered quite It was quite hard, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Being out here, you really get the feeling that their environment must have had an enormous impact on them. Yeah, I, th I think it did. It's very harsh and powerful, like their books. Yeah. Um, and I think it's that combination. You know, they, they were themselves out here. It offered liberty, um, this wild, sweeping landscape. But in 1824, Branwell, Emily and Anne discovered just how wild these moors could be. They were out walking near a peat bog, which had dried up after a long, hot summer. A sudden thunderstorm turned the peat into a rapidly expanding quagmire, creating what's known as a bog burst. Patrick Bronte described it as an earthquake, but it was more like a landslide with yeah. torrents of mud, boulders, everything in its way was carried down the valley. I imagine it would be a bit scary if all of this started yeah. to move towards yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. The bog burst made the local news, and the children were lucky to escape with their lives. All the accounts mention some children who were lost out on the moors and who took refuge in a local farmhouse. And we think that was the Brontes? We think that was the Brontes, and we think this is where they took refuge. Pondon Hall. Pondon Hall. The children knew Pondon Hall Farm well. It's thought some of Angria's characters were modelled on the Heaton family who lived here. 
These formative years around Howarth had a lasting impact on the Bronte children and they never forgot their imaginary worlds. But as I head towards the Lancashire border, I want to find out how leaving home helped turn them into the world-famous novelists we know today. Patrick simply couldn't afford to keep on maintaining his children. And in 1838, Branwell went off to Bradford to try his hand as a portrait painter, while the three girls, Emily, Charlotte and Anne, were sent away to be governesses for a while. It was a deeply unhappy time for them all. A Victorian governess led a lonely existence, being neither domestic servant nor part of the family. And Charlotte considered herself intellectually equal to her employers. But one job changed her life. She journeyed to Brussels to work as a teacher, where she fell in love with Constantine Hedger, the headmaster. Unfortunately, he was married and made it clear that he could never share her feelings. So Charlotte came home, where she poured out all her frustrations. She picked up her pen, and using the male-sounding name Curra Bell, she created her novel Jane Eyre, one of the most passionate love stories of English literature, with its brooding hero, Mr Rochester. There's a, a terrific description of Mr Rochester. His horse has just slipped and Jane goes out to help him. And it says, his figure was enveloped in a riding cloak, fur collared and steel clasped. Its details weren't apparent, but I traced the general points of middle height and considerable breadth of chest. He had a dark face with stern features and a heavy brow. His eyes and gathered eyebrows looked ireful and thwarted just now. Ugh. Jane Eyre is a classic love story. The tale of a lowly governess who falls for her aristocratic employer, Mr Rochester, whom she doesn't know is married. Charlotte dared to show that women could be as passionate as men. She also drew on personal experience for her characters and locations. Rochester is an amalgam of her childhood creation, the Duke of Zamorna, and Constantine Hedger. His very grand house, Thornfield Hall, was probably based on mansions Charlotte knew. But I'm visiting Wycolla Hall, the inspiration for Ferndean Manor, where the two lovers finally come together at the end of the novel. The Manor House of Ferndean was a building of considerable antiquity, moderate size, and no architectural pretensions, deep buried in a wood. Even when within a very short distance of the Manor House, you could see nothing of it. So thick and dark grew the timber of the gloomy wood about it. Well, that just about fits the bill, doesn't it? Wycolla Hall was a two-storey Elizabethan manor house, which in Charlotte's day was already starting to crumble. Jane Eyre is a good old-fashioned fantasy, but it's also a very modern story of desire across the social divide. Theatre director Polly Teal has adapted the book for the stage, and she thinks that the novel's bittersweet ending was something Charlotte could only dream about. What I find so moving about the end of the story and about Ferndean, the place where we are now, um, is that she's attempting to imagine something that was almost impossible, I think, for her as a Victorian woman, which is a marriage of equals. Of course, when she first meets Rochester, he's lord of the manor, you know, he's this rich, rather imperious, very charismatic, fascinating man, and James, his servant. And at the end of the novel, she comes here and Rochester's been scarred, he's lost his sight, his hand, and she's inherited money. And it allows them to come together as equals and to know each other in a different way. It's only by him shedding a load of stuff yeah. and her acquiring a load of stuff yeah. that they can become equals somehow. I think that's absolutely right. I know that originally a lot of people said Jane Eyre is Charlotte Bronte and then later people said, no, 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 it's, you know, it's much more objective, she's a novelist. But in a way, they were kind of right first time round, weren't they? I mean, I think that's one of the reasons the novel's so brilliant, that she put all of herself into it. The novel's full of this kind of um, conflict between this wildness and a kind of constraint. And I think that's very much Charlotte herself, you know, that on the one hand, 
she felt she had to be the dutiful daughter of the, the vicar. And on the other hand, she was this passionate creature with a huge imagination, intensely frustrated by her life and the fact that as a Victorian woman, there was so little available to her. So she was full of rage and longing. Fans of Jane Eyre included Queen Victoria. Although I'm not sure Her Majesty would have approved if she'd known a woman had written such racy material. Despite all the odds, Charlotte had opened the door for her sisters to follow. Spurred on by Charlotte's success, Emily and Anne published their first novels a few months later, also under male pen names, Ellis and Acton Bell. I'm off to get my head down for the night because tomorrow I'm heading up onto the moors that were the setting for one of those books. The most passionate and controversial Bronte novel of all. I'm walking through the South Pennine Moors in West Yorkshire, known as Bronte country. And today, I want to explore the setting for Emily Bronte's classic novel, Wuthering Heights. So I've left Wycollar, and I'm picking up the Pennine Way, up to the Moor Top Ruin at Top Withens. I'll soak up the atmosphere at the nearby Alcomden Stones, before dropping down to Hardcastle Crags, where I want to find out what the talented Branwell Bronte was up to, before ending my day in gentrified Hempton Bridge. It's a hearty 15-mile hike. Emily is the most enigmatic of the four Bronte siblings. Wuthering Heights is her only novel. Like Jane Eyre, it's become a classic love story, but it's a much darker tale and set almost entirely on the moors. It's a savage, supernatural saga of a doomed and tangled romance between a girl called Cathy her foster brother Heathcliff and Cathy's husband Edgar. And it's not to everyone's taste. For some people, Wuthering Heights is the best book that's ever been written, no question. But I must admit I feel a bit more ambivalent than that. Sure, there's some really good stuff in it. There's lots of romance and revenge and all that kind of thing. And there's that great character, Heathcliff, who's not really like the Laurence Olivier Heathcliff at all. He's more of a monster than a romantic anti-hero. So all that's pretty good. But the plot is really overwrought and complex and goes around their houses. And there's this one character, leading character, who dies out of the blue halfway through, which is really irritating. Actually, I should have put in a spoiler alert there, shouldn't I? Of course, there are plenty of readers who'd say that's the best bit, Tony. The book gets its name from an isolated farmhouse on the moors where Heathcliff descends into madness. The house Wuthering Heights is, of course, fictional, but that hasn't stopped legions of fans from around the world trying to find it. I love this. Look, it doesn't just tell us where to go. It helps our friends from Japan, too. Ahead of me lies the Bronte fans' Shangri-La, a lonely ruin called Top Withens. Emily described Wuthering Heights house as a gentrified mansion. Whereas until 1920, this was just a small working farm, one of three on this part of the moor. But to fans of the book, the exposed setting of Top Withens is unmistakably familiar. Local historian Steve Wood is going to show me around. That's a bit of a trek, isn't it? It is, Ron. Yes. Do we know who the people were who would have owned this place when Emily was around? It was a family called Sunderland who were here for most of the 19th century. Yeah. In the year that Wuthering Heights was published, 1847, there was an old man, Jonas Sunderland. It would have been a bleak life up here, wouldn't it? Terribly, especially in winter, dragging a living out of just 20 acres up here with, what, maybe four or half a dozen cows. The Sunderlands lived on an island of poor quality grass in a sea of heather, selling milk to the locals and existing on a bland diet. They lived off oats. They had porridge for breakfast. They made 
oat cakes hung to dry on a rack. But the reason why so many people are convinced that Emily had Top Withens in mind for her novel is because this picture illustrated the 1872 edition. It shows the three farms and near Withens and middle Withens depicted much as they actually were. But in this position, they put a much bigger house than what is actually here to fit the description of the house in the novel. That's quite plausible, isn't it? It's what any writer would do. You would choose an environment, but then you could stick any house you wanted to in it. Yes, of course. <laughs> Thanks for your help. See you. I'm taking a step off the well-beaten path to the highest point on my walk. It's crowned by a mysterious group of rocks made from millstone grit, the Alcondon Stones. They're only half a mile from Top Withens, but few tourists ever come here. Oh, wow, isn't this something? It never ceases to amaze me that even in today's world, you can find somewhere like this. Look, well, just a few farms and a couple of tiny wind turbines. But apart from that, no evidence of the modern world at all. The moor in Emily's novel isn't just untamed, it's a mythical realm. And local legend says that ancient druids used these stones as sacrificial altars. I can really imagine an intense young Emily locking somewhere like this away in her mind. The stones remind me of Heathcliff, Cathy and Edgar's final resting place on the moor at the end of the novel. I sought and soon discovered the three headstones on the slope next to the moor. I lingered round them under the benign sky, watched the moths fluttering among the heath and harebells, listened to the soft wind breathing through the grass, and wondered how anyone could ever imagine unquiet slumbers for the sleepers in that quiet earth. By the end of 1847, all three Bronte sisters were in print under the surname Bell. The youngest, Anne, had her debut novel, Agnes Grey, published in December that year. I now want to find out what had happened in the meantime to the missing Bronte, their brother, Branwell. So the next section of my walk takes me four miles south, off the moor, and into the shade of Hardcastle Crags. Branwell's an elusive character. He was social and outgoing, the complete opposite of his sisters. He'd left home in 1838 to try his hand at being a painter. But he lacked focus and wasn't quite the artist he hoped to be. When he was just 17, he created this famous family portrait only to paint himself out. By the start of the 1840s, he was living here in the Calder Valley near Halifax. Calderdale was up and coming. Gibson Mill was one of the first built during the Industrial Revolution, and in 1839, the valley also got a shiny new railway. I'm meeting up with Bronte biographer Juliet Barker, who says that Branwell was drawn by the opportunities here. Well, it was expected that a man would provide for the rest of his family and he, everybody expected that Bramwell would provide for his sisters. And he tried to be an artist and he'd failed at that. He tried to be a tutor and he'd failed at that. So he came here and Charlotte was very sarcastic about it and said he was going to be a great knight errant on the Leeds and Manchester railways. Yeah. What job did he do here? <laughs> he worked as a clerk on the railway, which was a boring job, it has to be admitted. Um, he sat there noting down which trains passed by, what cargo they were carrying, and which trains came back again and what they were carrying that way. But it was very well paid. And the thing was that he started off as an assistant clerk at Sorby Bridge Station, and then they built the line a bit further down, so he got to London Foot, and he was made the clerk in charge there, which was a promotion. So he went up from £105 a year to £130 a year. Branwell's job allowed him to carry on writing poetry. It also put him on the doorstep of Halifax, which in Victorian England was renowned as a centre of art and culture. People like, for instance, Liszt and Mendelssohn and Paganini all came and did concerts here in Halifax. 
but also there were a lot of poets and sculptors like J.B. Leyland who exhibited regularly in London and so he was mixing in these artistic literary circles and they were all encouraging him because they recognised his genius and they thought too that he was going to be a great poet or a great writer. So a big social life? A huge social life and he's often written off as spending his entire life in the pub but the reason he spent so much time in the pubs was that these were the places where they read their work to each other and it was at this point in his life that Bramwell started to get published. Long before his sisters got a thing in print, Bramwell Bronte got his poems published in the Halifax Guardian, the Leeds Mercury and in the Bradford Observer as well. Bramwell's literary efforts might not rival Jane Eyre or Wuthering Heights, but the local papers here had a very high reputation for the poems they printed. I'm following the stream down to Hebden Bridge, which today is filled with the sort of artistic types Branwell might have got on well with. This former mill town was once voted the fourth funkiest place to live in the UK. In the 1970s and 80s, musicians, artists and New Agers helped revive a town hit by industrial decline. It's also the ideal spot for a weary walker to spend the night. Tomorrow, I'm making my way back to Haworth to find out how the fortunes of the Bronte family changed this part of the world forever. I'm setting out from Hebden Bridge in West Yorkshire on the final leg of my walk through Bronte country. Today, I want to visit the pretty village of Luddenden before heading north across my final stretch of moorland. Near the end of my journey, I can take a short train ride from Oxenhope back to the Brontes' home and the end of their story in Haworth. But first, I want to finish the tale of Branwell Bronte, who was living here in the 1840s. I must admit, I didn't know much about Bramwell before I started out on my journey, but the more I find out about him, the more intriguing he becomes. The traditional view of Bramwell, one that he liked to encourage, is that he was a drunken hellraiser who neglected his job as a railway clerk. Friends said that he used to leave his station porter in charge, and certainly he enjoyed a few drinks in pubs like the Lord Nelson in London. But his bravado covered up a distressing episode. In 1842, he found himself in hot water when auditors checked his station's books. The story goes that 11 pounds, one shilling and sixpence, which was a heck of a lot of money in those days, had gone missing. So did the porter steal it? Who knows? But Bramwell got the sack. Bramwell was devastated by his dismissal. His sister Anne got him another post as a tutor, working alongside her for a family at Thorpe Green. But from here, things went really wrong for him. Branwell fell in love with his employer's wife, an older woman appropriately named Mrs Robinson. And she led him on, and then she dumped him, and he got the sack, and all this set him off on the road to self-destruction. A broken Branwell returned to Haworth to live with his elderly father, Patrick, and his three sisters. He spiralled into a pit of self-despair, suffering from shaking fits brought on by excessive drinking. Some say he was an opium addict. My own journey back to Haworth takes me past some of the modern moorland sites, wind turbines, the golf course, and several huge reservoirs. The moors round here are littered with reservoirs, but in the late 1840s, none of them existed. And before a supply of constant clean water arrived, the local towns were filthy, overcrowded and disease-ridden. In these conditions, Branwell's alcoholism soon masked the killer symptoms of tuberculosis. In 1848, he died aged just 31, in the arms of his father, who'd had such high hopes for his only son. Victorian England didn't really understand why so many young people were dying here. Patrick Bronte thought that the stink from open sewers was to blame. 
1849, he kick-started a campaign to clean up his parish that would eventually lead to today's reservoirs being built. Which reservoir is that? Uh, that's Leeming Reservoir. Now it's just hidden from view. Yeah. I'm meeting up with engineer Simon Firth from Yorkshire Water. So what kind of diseases had an impact down there? Well, the main waterborne diseases would have been cholera and typhoid, but, um, of course, tuberculosis was a big killer in the time. And Patrick's energy was, was very central in transforming this place into somewhere where people could actually live. Yes, it was his letter writing to the General Board of Health that got the whole thing off the ground. He had to write three times before they finally sent an inspector out to look at the conditions in Howarth. And what did the inspector say? Well, the Babbage report indicated that the, the possibly the worst uh, aspect of the town's conditions was the lack of clean water, and he put together a lot of recommendations uh, for, for collecting water off the hills and piping it down to the town. So did, did that do the magic trick? <laughs> Eventually, but it did take a lot more effort from Patrick Bronte to finally get it off the ground. He had to prod the General Board of Health and remind them. It's funny, isn't it? Most people know about the three Bronte sisters, and some people know about the brother. Yeah. But very few people know about Patrick, and yet he transformed things around here. He certainly did, yeah. But Patrick's campaign to clean up Howarth came too late for his own family. Within ten months of Branwell's death, tuberculosis had killed Emily, aged 30, and then Anne, at just 29. By 1849, Charlotte was the only one of his children still alive. I've arrived in Oxenhope, where there's the chance to journey in style back to Howarth on the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway. Uh, single to Howarth, please. Charlotte could never have realised at the time, but her presence was laying the foundations for the valley's tourist industry. I'm meeting Dr Lucasta Miller to find out how Charlotte helped create the Bronte legend after her sisters died. Charlotte must have been devastated that so soon after the whole business with Branwell, Emily and Anne died. I know. It, it's almost impossible to try and imagine what it must have felt like. Um, Emily's death was far more disturbing and devastating for Charlotte. She wouldn't admit she was ill. She wouldn't try any of the medicines that Charlotte tried to get for her. She wouldn't see a doctor. And Charlotte was utterly frustrated that she couldn't get through to her. She finally agrees to see the doctor, but it's, mm. it's far too late, and she dies that day, um, um, and as Charlotte describes it, she was torn, panting out of a happy life. Whereas Anne's death was less traumatic, Anne was very committed Christian and very sort of brave and a much quieter personality. The three sisters had always sworn to keep their true identities secret from the public. But now she was sole survivor, Charlotte was persuaded to break her promise. In 1848, her publishers invited her to London to mix among the capital's literary elite. Was it a massive shock when it was revealed that these three male authors were actually three young sisters? It was frightfully exciting to all the people down in London in the sort of literary coteries. The first reviews of Jane Eyre were pretty positive. By the time reviewers started to suspect that, in fact, it was by a woman, there was a complete sort of turnaround. I mean, we now think of Jane Eyre as a classic, but it was a sort of scandalous book, a naughty book, mm. as the critic G.H. Lewis put it to Charlotte, completely embarrassing her at the dinner table by sort of nudging her and saying, oh, you and I have both written naughty books. Mm. Um, especially when you find out that his naughty book has a character in it who's a woman writer who ends up as a prostitute on Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> Charlotte had let the genie out of the bottle and feared that life would never be the same again. So she decided to create a modest persona for her sisters to protect their memory. In 1850, she wrote a brief biographical notice of her sisters that was published with a reissue of, of Wuthering Heights. It's sort of a PR exercise. These women have got the reputation for writing immoral, scandalous, even anti-Christian books. 
Um, and Charlotte thinks that one way to get the public sympathy is to say, oh, they were these sort of uneducated country girls who just didn't know what they were doing when they wrote their shocking novels. Unlike her late sisters, Charlotte had found fame while still alive, and she didn't like it. In the 1850s, the first two Bronte tourists arrived in Haworth and were sent away from the parsonage with a flea in their ear. Today, they're welcomed with open arms, and they come from all over the world to visit the home where the sisters lived most of their lives. I've really enjoyed my walk through Bronte country, but as for the family saga, there's still one chapter left. In 1854, Charlotte, aged 38, married her father's assistant curate and became pregnant. But this happiness wasn't to last. She soon fell ill with extreme morning sickness and died at home from dehydration and exhaustion. This is the place where Charlotte was buried along with Emily and the rest of her family. And it's a point of pilgrimage for Bronte fans today. The pretty tourist village we see today is far removed from grim Victorian Howarth. It's the legacy of four talented children who never really left. Charlotte, Emily, Anne and Branwell Bronte. If you want to follow in my footsteps, you can download a guide to my walk by going to www.channel4.com. Pushing himself to the limit tomorrow night, back for a brand new series. We're trying to break records with speed with Guy Martin. That's at eight. Film time next tonight, though. Tom Hardy, Chris Pine and Reese Without a Spoon all star in our network premiere. This means war. It's, uh, it's been retained for all these years, so, yeah, it's a great piece. Patrick Bronte wanted to give his children the best start in life he could. He'd been born in a poor farm worker's cottage in Ireland, but he'd fought his way to Cambridge and believed that education was the key to escaping poverty. In 1820, just four months after Anne was born, Patrick started a new job in a larger parish. So like the Brontes, I'm making the journey to their new home in the village of Haworth. It wasn't a long journey for them, just seven miles along valley roads in their two flat wagons. My route is more exposed. My first taste of the moors and a path once used by pack horses. You can see why they still call this place Black Moor. The thick carpet of heather and rough grass means only hardy souls like North Country Cheviots are found up here. But whether you take the high road or the low road, you're still rewarded with a fantastic view of your destination, Haworth. Huh. That's not bad, is it? Actually, it only took me about 40 minutes to cross Blackmoor, but you can imagine the kids going, are we nearly there yet, Papa? Are we nearly there? Haworth is every bit the classic Yorkshire village. By 1820, this parish of scattered sheep farms had found a new source of wealth, the water that drains off the moors. In the 1800s, brand new machines powered by water and steam were transforming the cloth making industry in places like Haworth. When the Brontes arrived, Haworth was no longer a small village. It was an expanding township with 18 textile mills spread out across the valley, employing four and a half thousand men, women and children. This population squeezed into narrow sandstone houses built into the hillside. At the top was Patrick's parish church, accompanied by its rather grand parsonage. Not a bad step up from a terrace in Thornton. 
the new Bronte home overlooked the graveyard, where I'm meeting the current vicar, Peter Mayo Smith. When Patrick got this job, do you reckon he felt he'd landed on his feet? It's Charlotte, who was by far the bossiest, grabbed one of them and said, that is the Duke of Wellington. And then one of the other kids said that one of them was somebody else, and another kid, that's somebody else, that's somebody else. And that was the start of the fantasy worlds and adventures and landscapes that the four kids created together over the next few years. Charlotte and Branwell decided that their new heroes ruled an imaginary kingdom called the Glass Town. They chronicled it in obsessive detail. I've been allowed to handle these tiny magazines, which it suggested the Bronte children published for their little soldiers to read. The stuff that I like best, and it actually completely blew me away when I first read this. They've got tiny little adverts here, uh, which are quite bizarre. To be sold, a hundred horses by Gerald Dreadful. To be lent, the unprecedented sum of sixpence by Private Candlestick, who dwells between the gates of the Wall of Jericho and the Wall of China. Grand proposal by Sergeant Shuffle, which if carried into effect, will enable men to go to prison for nothing. It's Monty Python, it's the goon show. The booklets imitated real-life journals in their father's library, like Blackwood's magazine. But they also included poems, which are so much more than just childish parodies. Listen to this poetry. I think it's quite extraordinary. Tis pleasant on some evening fair after a summer's day, when still the breeze and calm the air and sea waves gently play, to view the bay o'er whose still breast white sails do softly glide. It's so effortless, so gentle. She, Charlotte was 12 or 13 when she wrote that. It's just staggering. The children had discovered a passion for storytelling and writing, which perhaps helped fill the void left behind by the deaths of their mother and sisters. But eventually the children's imaginations would take them beyond the confines of the parsonage. You can imagine them, can't you, peering out of the windows at the wildness of the moors beyond. And that is where I'm heading tomorrow. I'm on a... My walks take me to every corner of Britain as I seek out history embedded in the landscape. In this country, you're never very far from mysterious ruins or the shadow of unwelcome visitors. So from romantic moors to majestic peaks, I'm really enjoying some serious walking. Each of my walks leads me through a different time and a stunning location to find the stories you can only really appreciate on foot. This time, I'm walking through the West Yorkshire Moors to discover how they inspired England's greatest literary family and two of the finest novels ever written. This classic moorland became the backdrop both for Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. Why? because it was the real-life home of their creators, the tragic but brilliant Bronte sisters. This is the Worth Valley in West Yorkshire. Just 10 miles from Bradford and Halifax, it's known to millions of people as Bronte country. In the early 19th century, the countryside here was home to three exceptionally talented novelists. Charlotte, Emily and Anne Bronte were born into a world of mills and moors, where nearby Bradford was becoming the wool capital of the world. Today, the city's wool exchange is a bookshop, where the Victorian past lives on in print. Bronte's write about love and hardship in this really intense and passionate way that still feels raw 150 years later. 
Although I must admit there's a part of me that does find whole chunks of the books really hard going. I reckon I'm in the minority though because there, there are legions of Bronte fans who simply can't put them down. And after all these years, they still fly off the shelves. The most famous Bronte novels are Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. They've been translated into almost every language on earth and turned into over a hundred films, plays and dramas. But the lives of the three sisters and their wayward brother Branwell read like one of their books. So I've put together a four-day circular walk to uncover their story. From their birthplace in Thornton, I'll venture out into the countryside where they set so many of their stories, ending my first day at the family home in Haworth, a Victorian village with a killer secret. On day two, I'll step onto the moors and visit a crumbling ruin immortalised in Jane Eyre. Day three sees me explore the empty wilderness that inspired Wuthering Heights before moving down into the Calder Valley. Luddenden is the first stop on my final day before it's over the moors once more to the tragic final chapter in the Bronte saga, back at Haworth. I'm starting my walk in Thornton, which is four miles from Bradford city centre. In 1815, this was a small country village where a new curate, the Reverend Patrick Bronte, had just arrived to set up home with his wife, Mariah. They already had two young daughters, two-year-old Mariah and baby Elizabeth, and they would have four more children over the next five years. Here we are, this is where the Bronte story started, 77 Market Street, Thornton. They don't shout about it, do they? There's no big ticket office or advertising hoardings, it's just this little plaque. In this house were born the following members of the Bronte family, Charlotte, 1816, Patrick Branwell, 1817, Emily Jane, 1818, and 1820. Number 77 has now become a coffee shop. Can I have a cappuccino, please? Yeah, of course. The current owner, Mark De Luca, is more barista than Bronte. He's created a literary cafe inside this simple terraced house. Patrick Bronte complained that it was ill-constructed and inconvenient, but it was a happy home for his growing family. It's a bit kind of weird that you come up these little steps so close to the front. Yeah, well, uh, this was extended in the 1900s when it was Lovitz the Butchers. So this is the authentic bit? Yeah, this is the kitchen. This is where the Brontes were born, in front of the fireplace. The real thing? The real thing. So gorgeous here. Well, it's gorgeous now. I'm not sure it would have been when he arrived. Imagine this place without trees, no buildings behind, a church that was actually falling down when he arrived, <laughs> very cold, and a working-class village, very mill-oriented, with children working in the mills and things like that. The graveyard, well, I was going to say it looks very beautiful. It looks very packed. It is packed. Estimates between 20 to 60,000 bodies. 20 to 60,000? Yes, as many as that. It's such a tiny place. Yes. And now, Patrick's predecessor, one of his predecessors, William Grimshaw, it's reputed did a thousand baptisms a year and never saw the population increase. That gives you an idea of what's going on. So that's indicative of a lot of disease that kills? Unfortunately, yes. Haworth was one of the unhealthiest places to live in Victorian England. Tuberculosis flourished and decaying matter from the graveyard seeped down into the stream which people used for drinking water. 40% of children here didn't reach their fifth birthday. The average life expectancy was just 25 years. I'd like to show you this, Tony, which yeah. I think illustrates the problem very well. If we have a look at it, we've got Elizabeth. She dies in 1857 at the time of Patrick Bronte. She's only six years old. And then we've got Mary, another daughter, who dies when she's two. Yes. Then Sarah, another daughter, 24. Yep. Emma, a daughter. 21. And Joshua, their son. 24th. That gives you a good picture of what's going on. Yeah, yeah. It's really very sad. <laughs> 
A year after they moved into the parsonage, Patrick's own wife, Mariah, died from uterine cancer, aged 38. Their two oldest daughters died next from tuberculosis, which they caught at a nearby boarding school. A devastated Patrick decided for the time being to bring up Charlotte, Branwell, Emily and Anne at home. It created a bond between the four children which would last their entire lives. Charlotte and Branwell were suddenly the eldest and they used their imaginations to escape the grim reality of life in Haworth. One day all the kids are around and her dad comes in with this box of soldiers for his little boy Branwell. But before Branwell had even had a chance to lay them all out, 